Iranian President Ibrahim Raisi meets with Chinese President Xi Jinping in an effort to deepen the two countries' strategic partnership. Hello, I'm Arnold Naidu, and this is The Heat. For the first time since taking office in 2021, the Iranian president traveled to Beijing for a state visit at the invitation of President Xi. The two leaders pledged to accelerate implementation of their 25-year cooperation agreement covering energy, trade and infrastructure under China's Belt and Road Initiative. We begin our coverage with this report from Zhao Yunfei in Beijing. A major upgrade in China-Iran ties as Chinese President Xi Jinping met his Iranian counterpart Abraham Raisi. It's President Raisi's first visit to China since taking office in 2021. President Xi says the two sides should see their relationships at a strategic level and that both countries should play an active role in world peace. He says China will further implement cooperation plans and deepen communication under the Belt and Road framework. President Raisi says he's looking forward to the cooperation in trade and infrastructure. He says Iran encourages Chinese investments and welcomes Chinese tourists. China and Iran have long-term comprehensive cooperation in a range of fields, including trade and cultural exchanges. The two countries have vowed to boost all-round cooperation. The relationship between China and Iran is based on multiple areas of common interest as well as shared concerns over Western sanctions against the Islamic country. Beijing says its cooperation with Tehran can help enhance solidarity between the Middle East countries. The two presidents also exchanged views on international issues. President Xi says China supports Iran's stance in protecting its sovereignty and territorial integrity and that any confrontation should be resolved through dialogue and negotiation. President Raisi says both nations are against hegemony and unilateralism. He says Iran is willing to strengthen communication with China on regional affairs. The two sides have signed bilateral cooperation documents in many fields, including agriculture, trade, tourism, environmental protection, public health, disaster relief, culture and sports. The Iranian president has also met with Chinese Premier Li Keqiang and chairman of the Standing Committee of the National People's Congress, Li Zhanshu. China-Iran relations have maintained a momentum of sound growth, featuring stronger political mutual trust, steady progress in practical cooperation in various fields, and sound communication and coordination in international and regional affairs in defense of the principle of non-interference in internal affairs and the common interest of developing countries. China and Iran enjoy a traditional friendship. Beijing says President Raisi's three-day visit can further boost the comprehensive strategic partnership between the two nations. Zhao Yunfei, CGTN, Beijing. For more now on China-Iran relations, let's bring in our panel. Joining us from Tehran is Mohammad Marandi. He's the chair of the American Studies Department at the University of Tehran. Also with us, Ali Akbar Dareni is a researcher and writer at the Journal of the Center of Strategic Studies in Tehran. From Portland, Oregon, Yan Liang is a chair professor of economics at Willamette University. And Aina Tangan is a senior fellow at the Taha Institute and chairman of Asia Narratives in Beijing. Thank you, everyone, for being with us. Uh, Anna Tangan, uh, this is President Raisi's visit, uh, or the first visit, by an Iranian leader to China in 20 years. And there was an interesting comment from a professor at the London School of Oriental and African Studies. He says, we are in the middle of a momentous reordering of world politics. New alliances are emerging and strengthening. That was from uh, the professor Ashin Mogadem in London. Uh, and this visit takes place at a time when both Iran and China are under pressure from the West, particularly the United States and its allies. So given all of that, give us a sense of the significance of these high-level bilateral meetings that have taken place. 
Well, quite clearly, uh, China is reaching out. They made a sweeping statement about, uh, you know, sovereignty and making sure that Iran is uh, not uh, subject to sanctions. They're calling for them to lift, be lifted. Also, a resumption of the uh, nuclear talks. But, you know, in the background, if you take a step back, what you see is uh, Iran is attempting to normalize its relationships, uh, both with uh, BRICS uh, and also through SCO. But at the same time, it is still facing headwinds in terms of, um, you know, acceptance locally, especially among uh, in the Arab world, uh, where, you know, very significantly Xi Jinping met uh, with the uh, Arab uh, North African uh, countries, uh, all except Iran. So uh, there's a lot of economic uh, issues out there, the 25-year agreement, et cetera. Uh, the question is how to go forward. Um, and, you know, there are 20 agreements signed. But, you know, Iran is looking for more uh, substantial support in, the, in terms of actual money flowing. So, Anna, from the Chinese point of view, what were the priorities for this meeting? Well, I, I mean, some of it was, it was the, uh, the optics, uh, making sure that people understood that uh, China uh, and Iran are not making a military alliance. They're simply engaging in trade. Uh, there was a statement by the, uh, the foreign ministry making sure that this is not a seen as, uh, you know, some attempt to, uh, you know, do something about the U.S. in uh, the Middle East. This is simply about trade, uh, continuing uh, China's policy. But it's a very strong statement, especially at this time, given that uh, China is, you know, under a tremendous amount of pressure. People are automatically going to say, well, it's uh, China, Russia, uh, you know, uh, Iran. Uh, and other countries that are hostile to the U.S., uh, but you don't see any kind of formalization, uh, as you've seen with Quad and AUKUS and things like that. This is simply all based on trade. So uh, it'll be interesting to see what the uh, the press uh, and the international press uh, reads into this. But at this point, uh, China is just trying to make sure that it's seen that it's supporting uh, the sovereignty of other nations and trying to uh, encourage peace. Mohammed Marandi, President Raisi, was accompanied by uh, a very large and powerful delegation uh, to this visit in Beijing. Uh, the plan, we heard, was to boost economic and trade ties. But uh, overall, what was the Iranian goal and what do you think was accomplished? It was a, uh, an important delegation. I had the opportunity to accompany the team, and it was very clear that the uh, relationship between China and Iran has evolved uh, significantly. Uh, the two leaders met earlier in Uzbekistan uh, during the SCO conference, and, uh, uh, and on this trip, uh, significant agreements were made in, in a host of different fields. Western media tries to uh, depict this as some sort of anti-Western alliance and, as your previous guest pointed out, speak of Russia, Iran, and China. But I think for the Iranians and the Chinese, it is basically working to develop uh, a natural relationship. Iran is a very influential country in West Asia. It's probably by far the most important uh, power in West Asia with very powerful allies in Iraq and Syria and Lebanon in Yemen. And, of course, uh, it is linked to China both by land and sea through a Central Asia and the Persian Gulf. And uh, Iran has the second largest gas reserves in the world and argu arguably the third or fourth largest uh, oil reserves in the world. So uh, for China, Iran's energy is very important. And for Iran, China being a rising global power, uh, it is also very significant, especially in uh, artificial intelligence and new technologies. The Chinese have made huge progress, uh, which has earned them uh, sanctions from the United States. But for the Iranians, it's a source of um, or an incentive for greater cooperation with that country. So uh, especially since the United States and the Europeans choose to antagonize Iran and sanction Iran. So. The idea that was discussed a lot was the sort of the convergence of Asia at a time when Asia is rising.
Ali Akbar Dareni, China and Iran, as we mentioned a moment ago, have signed this 25-year strategic cooperation pact. And it's expected that this summit will focus on the implementation of that agreement. What can you tell us about the pact and um, where it goes to from here? Uh, the 25-year um, cooperation program uh, signed in 2021 uh, shows that uh, Iran and China are moving towards uh, patching up relations. They face uh, similar challenges. Uh, and um, the, um, uh, this is a major program that has not been implemented so far. Uh, a major goal of President Raisi's visit to China, were, according to senior Iranian officials, uh, is to finalize the operational mechanisms of this agreement. Uh, I believe two um, key global developments convinced Iran to reconsider its foreign policy priorities in the past few years. Uh, this change of priorities uh, began under the, uh, in the last years of the previous Rouhani administration, but got momentum with, uh, with Raisi elected president in 2021. Uh, one was the United States' failure to lift the sanctions against Iran and later its unilateral withdrawal from the Iran nuclear deal known as the JCPOA. And the other is the, a, a shift in, in uh, world power. Uh, we are witnessing a, uh, a change in, in the international order, and uh, we are witnessing uh, we are witnessing that uh, the world is in transition from a unipolar uh, system to a multipolar system. So new coalitions are emerging in the world, and uh, Iran opposes U.S. hegemony. Uh, it supports a multipolar system, and it has adopted a pragmatic policy of uh, creating coalitions with the non-Western world. Mm -hmm. uh, towards this end, uh, Iran is pursuing a genuine policy uh, of improving relations with China, Russia, and the rest of the uh, non-Western world. It doesn't mean that Iran is entirely ignoring the West. It means that Iran's priority is to interact more and uh, patch up relations with countries like China. This is not a tactic. This is a strategy. While Iran's strategic direction remains unchanged under the uh, Raisi administration, mm -hmm. its foreign policy uh, has witnessed visible changes. We see changes in tone. We see changes uh, in uh, priorities. Mm -hmm. So, uh, to, uh, it would, uh, to understand President Raisi's uh, visit to China, uh, we, uh, it would uh, be better to include these two uh, developments in order to understand it better. Yan Liang, uh, according to Iranian data, Iran's exports to China in the 10 months of the year, that, which will end in March, uh, amounted to $12.6 billion, and Chinese exports uh, amounted to $12.7 billion. So uh, where do you see the greatest potential here for an expansion of the trade between these two countries? Yeah, good to talk to you, Anand. Um, so first of all, I wanted to point out that, you know, these two countries share really long-term economic relationships and that the economic ties dated back to, you know, the, the first century B.C. and the two countries established formal economic ties back in 1937. So there's a lot of room for trade and investment cooperation, uh, despite some of the ups and downs, you know, in the relationships um, due to, you know, uh, for example, the COVID pandemics and also for, you know, the geopolitical tensions around the world. So that said, I think prior to the pandemic, the two countries had really large volume of trade. Uh, 2019, the two, two countries, two-way trade was, um, you know, uh, 30, $33 billion. Uh, but this year and last year, I think uh, because of pandemic, we have seen some uh, slowdown in trade. And also investment, um, pretty much we see the same pattern. Uh, back in 2019, um, the Chinese companies poured $3.4 billion of foreign direct investment to Iran. And 
this has gone down uh, to $185 million just last year. So many of the Western observers would um, jump to the conclusion and say, you know, the two economic, uh, the, two t the two countries' economic ties have been weakened. Uh, but I think, again, uh, we will see greater potential for the two countries to continue to trade. China still remains to be the largest trade partner of Iran, and Iran remains very important for China in terms of um, imports of oil. Um, Iran is the seventh largest uh, um, uh, oil importers uh, for China. Mm. Um, so I think there are a lot of uh, potential, uh, you know, trade in the areas like energy, right, crude oil. Um, and also China has provided many, uh, you know, commodities and money pr pr products that Iran needs, um, such as automotive vehicles and also a lot of electrical ma machinery. So in some ways, I think, you know, these countries' um, economies have a lot of complementary uh, 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 sort of needs and, and production. So I think that these two countries will continue to trade. And when it comes to investment, yeah. uh, Iran remains very important as the key link um, in the Bell Row initiative. So I think there will be a lot more um, infrastructure projects um, that linking, you know, ports, railways, and um, uh, water conservancy and technology, yeah. and all these will strengthen the ties. Right. Yang Yang, you talked there about the Belt and Road Initiative. Um, of course, Iran is a participant in that initiative. This is what President Raisi said in an address at Peking University. Let's listen. Iran welcomes the Belt and Road Initiative proposed by China stands ready to work with China to safeguard world peace and promote world development, and is willing to work with China to open up the Maritime Silk Road connecting the East and West with its geographical advantages. Iran, with its abundant energy resources, and more importantly, its political independence, is well placed to play a positive role in restoring peace and stability and promoting development. So, Yang Liang, as Mohammed Marandi pointed out a moment ago, Iran is in West Asia, which is uh, an important part of the world. It also straddles East and West uh, in a way. So, how important is this part of the Belt and Road Initiative for Iran? And what are the sort of kinds of infrastructure projects that we will be seeing? Right. So, as you said, I think Iran occupies a very strategic, uh, important location, and it's also um, has the technology, has the has the um, energy, and many of the other necessary ingredients um, to de to make these kinds of you know uh, BRI projects uh, work um, for China and the rest of the world. So one thing I think is very important to understand is that you know Iran could be the place where many of the infrastructure projects and construction can be uh, assembled and shipped to the rest of Africa and other parts of you know uh, Middle East and Africa. So I think, you know, one thing that is important is all these basic infrastructures like ports, railways and uh, roads um, that would help to facilitate trade, not only between the two countries, but also with other BRI participants. Um, there's also many other uh, possible areas for uh, cooperation. I think um, President Xi has pledged, right, to import more agricultural products from Iran and also to strike more bilateral deals in tourism, uh, environmental mm -hmm. protection, health, culture, sports, and disasters relief. Um, so I think the list goes on. Um, yeah. It just means that the two countries would have a lot of uh, future, you know, uh, corporations. Anna Tangan, uh, Iran's chief nuclear negotiator, Ali Bagheri Khani, was also in the delegation that went to Beijing. Uh, we heard President Xi Jinping say that all relevant sanctions should be abolished in a verifiable manner, promoting the agreement's full and effective implementation, uh, as we heard that deal known as the JCPOA. Does this tell us that China is still hopeful that this deal can be resuscitated and put back on track? Uh, not really. Um, the, the U.S. is uh, fairly uh, fixed in its position. It's uh, clear that the, the, this administration under Biden is not willing to go forward with the JCPOA. Uh, they're more concerned about domestic issues, any kind of uh, rapprochement. Uh, with Iran would be seen as weakness. Uh, it would become a political issue in the upcoming uh, 2024 presidential race. Uh, so I, I think what China is doing is trying to be on the right side of history on this, uh, appealing especially to the um, 
uh, to the EU countries uh, who favor this. Uh, they were not happy about the unilateral withdrawal of the United States. Uh, and I think this is a clear message that uh, China is trying to say, as you know, it has before, uh, that they favor uh, a, a address to this issue about uh, nuclearization. Uh, they do not uh, you know, want to see the situation deteriorate further. Uh, Iran is increasingly has more capabilities uh, if it so chooses to go a nuclear weapons route. Mohammed Mirandi, uh, you actually served as an advisor to the Iranian delegation to those nuclear talks. You were also in the delegation that visited Beijing, as you pointed out to us. What should we read into the fact that Iran's chief nuclear negotiator, Ali Bagheri Khani, was in that delegation to China? Um, and what is your view of that deal getting back on track? Because as Anna Tangan just pointed out to us a moment ago, domestic U.S. politics is going to get in the way of that. Domestic U.S. politics is what blocked the JCPOA from being re-implemented, because the talks that were held in Vienna, in which I was a media advisor, uh, they had basically reached a conclusion. On the last day of the Vienna talks, the EU gave a text uh, to the different parties, and uh, it met almost all of Iran's minimal requirements. And the uh, different delegations went home. The Iranians went home and looked over the text, made a few small changes, but significant, and sent it back. And uh, the EU, EU foreign policy chief, Joseph Borrell, said that Iranian demands were reasonable. At that time, there should have been a deal, because Mr. Borrell is obviously an ally of the United States. But as your previous guest referred to, um, it was U.S. internal politics. We were approaching the midterm elections, and Biden didn't want to be accused of being seen as weak, so he failed to take the final step. So we were basically there. We reached a final text. Uh, but the United States, for obvious reasons, uh, they, they failed to make the final step. Right now, there really isn't much, there really isn't much to negotiate. Uh, it's just that the United States would have to make a decision if they wanted the deal re-implemented. Re Dr. Balgani's trip there to, uh, or his presence in the delegation, was obviously linked to the fact that he's the deputy foreign minister, and he had negotiations in China for a host of different reasons. They were discussing uh, decreasing uh, tensions in, in West Asia and uh, the Persian Gulf region. And, and other issues linked to global politics. Um, and I think that uh, the... And one thing that I should add, which sort of goes beyond the scope of your question, is that uh, one thing that has increased, I, th I think, the pace of the talks or the, uh, the uh, convergence of the two sides or the, the move of the two sides, the Iranians and the Chinese, to, to, to sign these agreements, was the war in Ukraine and the sanctions against Russia. Uh, the fact that Russia is now sanctioned by the United States and the EU uh, makes it more necessary than before for the Chinese to find alter, um, alternative means for trade uh, that go outside the realm of Western-controlled financial institutions. So the two sides have been working on mechanisms so that they can increase cooperation in the field of energy so that they could uh, increase investment without needing to go through the mechanisms, the traditional mechanisms that have been uh, designed by the West and controlled by the West. Ali Akbar Dareni, uh, in September of last year, Iran signed a memorandum to join the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, the SCO, as we heard. And that's a pretty powerful grouping. I mean, it groups China. Russia, India, Pakistan, and the former Soviet states in Central Asia. Um, and we've heard the SCO being variously described as a counterweight to Western influence. Um, Iran still has to go through a part of the process because, before it becomes a full member, but it does attend meetings right now. What does this membership mean for Iran? Uh, it means that Iran has... Uh started uh, a new uh, foreign policy of looking to the East. Uh, no matter the JCPOA is revived or not, Iran has decided to pursue 
it's looked to the East uh, policy vigorously while simultaneously looking for solutions from inside. That means Iran's priority is to defeat the sanctions. And one way of defeating the sanctions is to uh, form coalitions and improve relations with the non-Western world. And Iran's, uh, Iran is already in the process of joining the Shanghai Cooperation Organization. Uh, and it is also uh, seeking to join BRICS, uh, five emerging economies that comprise uh, China, India, Russia, Brazil, and South Africa. So this is this suggests that uh, Iran has um, has adopted a new policy under the under the uh, Raisi administration to boost relations uh, with the East. Uh, uh, at the same time, the, the United States has given up uh, the option of reviving the JCPOA and lift the sanctions. It has switched to its uh, plan B, and its plan B is to intensify economic terrorism and sanctions against Iran. Um, and um, uh, one way to, uh, to thwart uh, America's plan B is to improve relations with BRICS and with Shanghai uh, Cooperation Organization, including uh, China. And China plays an important role in that. Uh, so the, uh, to me, the Belt and Road Initiative is uh, is not only an economic development project. It is a major mega geopolitical project uh, for China to gain influence and power and turn its, uh, itself into a, uh, a global leader. It is designed to enable China to assume a leadership role in, in global affairs. Uh, the Road and Belt Initiative uh, is unlikely to achieve all its goals yeah. in Western Asia without Iran. China needs a gate to enter Western Asia. Iran is that gate. Iran is China's winning card mm -hmm. in Western Asia. Um, Iran is a security player. Uh, it has both security making right. and security uh, breaking capabilities. Uh, it, um, it was Iran that defeated ISIS, Iran's fight against uh -huh. terrorism and extremism in Western Asia yeah. uh, is, uh, is a key proof that uh, Iran is a security player. Without Iran's fight against terrorism, uh, terrorist groups would have ravaged uh, Western right. Asia in a more disastrous uh, way. So Iran has decided to follow its look to the East policy, uh -huh. no matter the JCPOA is revived or not, okay. or even no matter what is going to happen. Okay. Yan Liang, you were telling us a moment ago, you were talking about the energy interests between these two countries, Iran and China. Uh, and much of this meeting has been focused on that interest. As you pointed out, Iran is one of the world's major exporters of oil and gas. Uh, but what about cooperation in other sectors? And I'm thinking of things like agriculture, renewable energy, where China is leading uh, development, um, and also industrial cooperation. Yeah, that's a great question. I think uh, we realized that uh, among the delegates, um, the central banker of Iran also visited China. So there is a rich ground, I think, for both countries to uh, continue to cooperate in, for example, the banking sector and the financial system. Um, as we all know that, you know, the United States now is still have the dominant monopoly power in the SWIFT system, the international banking system. So I think it's important for, you know, an alternative system uh, to, to set up, to come to way um, this kind of monopoly. Um, and another very fertile ground, I think, um, as you point out, is renewable energy. And uh, Iran has been developing nuclear energy. So I think there are ways for both countries to, uh, you know, cooperate. And last but not least, I also want to point out when it comes to, for example, knowledge goods, uh, both countries have the interest to increase the footprint of mm -hmm. innovation and technology yeah. in the underdeveloped markets like Africa. So Iran just opened um, the house, the Iran house of innovation and technology in Kenya. So I think you know these two countries can also cooperate in how to commercialize some of the innovative ideas and also export these knowledge-based products in East Africa yeah. and elsewhere. 
Okay, and that's where we have to leave it. Thanks to all of you for being with us. That's it for this edition of The Heat. I'm Arnand Naidu in Washington, D.C. Thank you for watching.